Now to a we on a special interview. You may wonder who is Juan Carlos Varela Rodriguez and why is we on speaking with him? Well, Varela Rodriguez is the president of Panama. It's a tiny country sandwiched between Costa Rica and Colombia in South America and is most famous for the Panama Canal linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. To India, Panama is home to Mossack Fonseca. The law firm would set up 200,000 shell companies to help wealthy individuals avoid paying tax, including many Indians. Our correspondent, Daniele Pagani, interviewed President Rodriguez. Listen in. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce our guest with us today, a president of a country which, despite being tiny in size, is one of the most relevant economies in the world, the president of Panama. When the scandal surrounding the operations of the Panama-based Mossack Fonseca law firm hit the headlines, President Juan Carlos Varela Rodriguez of Panama came out swinging in defense of his country. His point was that Mossack Fonseca setting up shell companies to help wealthy individuals avoid paying tax was not a problem for Panama alone. It involved many other countries and investigations should reflect that. Was he successful in salvaging Panama's reputation? Not quite. Panama was put on the European Union's tax blacklist. In India, 424 Indians were found to have links with Mossack Fonseca. Of them, 205 had links to offshore entities named in the Panama Papers. 60 other Indians remained untraced, even as investigations blood on. Did the scandal shake India-Panama relations? Given the levels of trade are low and Panama does not figure as a heavyweight on the American continent, perhaps no. But Panama was the first Latin American country where India set up an embassy. There are around 15,000 Indians here. The Indian IT has roots here and Indians are also in the diamond trade. Some of Varela's other actions have raised eyebrows in New Delhi, such as, for instance, his decision last year to adhere to the One China policy. It flowed from the fact that China is the second largest user of the Panama Canal, so it made good business sense. Xi Jinping called him a hero and welcomed him in Beijing with full honors. It underscored Beijing's long-term plans for Panama, positioned very close to the North American market. But President Varela is not just a career politician. He comes from one of Panama's richest families and served on the board of the family's liquor business. He's been president since 2014, was vice president before that and also held the post of foreign minister. Panama is acknowledged to be among the fastest growing economies in the world. Mr. Varela, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, yes. Global is one leadership. We are meeting on the sides of a global summit in defense of human rights, so I want to start from there. What is the role that Panama has in defending human rights and fighting against those who violate human rights? Panama is a country committed to defend and promote human rights. We have a vice, the vice presidency of, and we were the country most voted to have that position in the United Nations Human Rights Committee. We also have a woman, Panamanian woman, that is a member of the Commission, Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. Uh, we're an advocate, personally I'm an advocate for human rights during my 45 months as president of Panama. We have never used force in any social situation with our people, always promote dialogue, tolerance. So it's a country that has uh, respect human rights, protect its own people, and also the most important human right, the right to live. No? No? So we are always uh, asking political leaders to take decisions that promote human rights and don't put people on the, on the, in danger because of decisions taken by some leaders. And also this conference here in, in Amman is very important because it's about children, the human rights of children on the move. Uh, especially this morning was very, very sad for me because one uh, a year and a half a uh, girl died in my country, not in my country, trying to cross from Colombia to Panama by boat, by being handled by human traffickers, and we fight against that. And, and the boat had some problems, and then this little girl died. So we're always uh, defending the human rights of immigrants, of children on the move, and especially for our own citizens, and we fight for that worldwide, everywhere we go. And this, Mr. President, leads me into my following question, which is uh, uh, you have a privileged point of view being in the Central and South American region. What are the most common human rights violations you're facing there, and what needs to be done in order to fight and stop them? 
especially uh, children, and, and also in, the, in some areas where are the, well, the, the, the young people live like at risk, they, they, they are threatened by the violence, by the organized crime. Also, the, the young people from the region, especially from Central America, they have to migrate looking for a better future. Sometimes they, their rights are not respected, especially the immigrants crossing through our area. We have to allow them to cross. We have to be able to protect them. We cannot let them be uh, human traffickers to use them. So any immigrant that comes to our country from the border with Colombia, we will protect them and, and take it to the next border. They are in our continent. Sometimes they come from Nepal, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, there's, there's young kids looking for a better future. So we have to protect them. So I would say that not allowing the flow of immigration to, to go is something that has to be taken care of. That's, I, and also in some countries, especially in the Yales, they have to improve the, 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 what, the, what, what they're doing do with them. But in our country, I would say that we don't have any issues. Thanks, Scott. Uh, we seem to live in a moment in the world where international bodies, I'm thinking about the United Nations, the UN Security Council, kind of struggle to implement their resolutions. I'm thinking about the failed ceasefire, the difficult peace process in Syria. Mr. President, what can be done in order to empower these agencies to get especially state actors to respect human rights? We need more commitment from the leaders of the big countries so they can put their difference aside and find a solution to the problems that are affecting the people, like the conflict in Syria. Sometimes because of the, their competing or these other issues, of their, uh, then they put aside the main problem, which is protecting human life and, and the human rights of people. So I would say that we need more commitment from, from world leaders so they can compromise to execute what is needed to protect the life of, of, of people that is at risk in different areas of the war. And do you think that countries like Panama, for instance, and India, speaking from an Indian perspective, who are perceived as neutral many times, especially in this region, can cooperate and find synergies, among many other countries, obviously, to get this commitment done? For sure, we can address uh, the, this issue of how we can stop this conflict, because at some point, all, all these big countries, they need, they need us, even though they were neutral countries, but they need us for some different purposes. So we need to put this, this objective of stopping all these conflicts as part of our agenda of, of foreign affairs policies. So that's very important for me because at the end I went to Satari camp today here in, in Jordan. Everybody wants to go back to our country. So we have refugees because we don't solve the conflicts. We have to solve the conflicts. If we solve the conflicts, then we won't have refugees. In our region, then we have the situation with Venezuela now that there's many people leaving the country because of the political situation. It started as a political crisis, an economic crisis, now a humanitarian crisis. So we have to solve this problem so we don't have people leaving or fleeing our countries. What instruments do we have to bring back dialogue? Because at the end of the day, ending a conflict is largely based on dialogue between the parties. It seems everyone is deaf in this world sometimes. We have to strengthen the capacities of the multilateral uh, effort that is done and also when a decision is taken, make sure that it's respected by everybody. Because as you ma mentioned, if you write a statement or you make a decision, an, an announcement, and then not, nobody pays attention to it, then we start weakening the system. And Mr. President, talking a little bit about the relations between Panama and India, you haven't been there yet. I'm sure the Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be happy to welcome you. Do you plan to go? And what kind of areas of cooperation do you see between Panama and India? I'm, I'm receiving a new ambassador from India to Panama this week, once I'm back in Panama. The Vice President of India vice, uh, is coming to Panama too. I plan to, to make an official visit, uh, coordinated with the government, and we're going to strengthen our embassies, and we're also uh, um, now starting to eliminate uh, or to change the visas uh, that are restricted today to stamp it visas issue in our consular offices in New Delhi and Mumbai. So we, we after recognize after supporting the One China policy, our next step will be to get in closer to India too, and try to get uh, closer to the Middle East, India and Southeast Asia, also. So we we look we see India as a as a potential uh, partner of our country in the near future. China wouldn't be a problem in that. No, it's part of the of, of this all this effort of trying to diversify of, polit of, of foreign policy. And um, of course, I now have the uh, fortune of having you a global leader here. So I know you speak for your country, uh, but in India, we are very interested about how is the relation between Panama and the U.S. after um, Donald Trump uh, election. Your privileged view will help us to understand how to manage such a president. It's a stable relationship because the, our institutions were very close, or law enforcement agencies. The different institutions are, they've been there for many years. We have a, 
uh, a very strong relationship with the United States. We're regional partners, very strong allies. So we, if we disagree in some issues, then it, that is always the, the big picture is above that. So I feel that, that we, we made our case. We have a very a dialogue, honest and direct dialogue, and we're, gonna, we're going to the Summit of the Americas in Lima two weeks from now, and at the summit we will have the opportunity to, to express our view of different issues, but we are, have a very good coordination with them uh, in different uh, areas, foreign investment, uh, regional security, uh, the fight against organized crime, uh, immigration, and even if we can disagree with some policies, at the end we coordinate and we do our best effort to keep a strong relationship. And talking about, you said commitment is necessary in order to force, so to say, global leaders uh, to respect uh, human rights and fight their violations. We are now in West Asia, this is how we call this area from India, a turbulent region with many refugees. What can be your commitment in this region in order to help refugees? The best, the best, the best for me will be to bring the regions together. We have to, to send a message to Latin America that Islam is about peace, that Islam is about faith. Islam doesn't have anything to do with these activities that were conducted by ISIS and, and, and other uh, terrorist groups. And because sometimes people get scared when they see somebody from, 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 from this region coming to, our, to Latin America, and we have to change that. Uh, I used to visit Dubai uh, one month ago, and I saw half a million Pakistanis working there in the hotels everywhere. You know, when sometimes somebody from this region crossed to America, People feel that they could represent some kind of threat. So changing that mind will be very important for me. So bringing using Panama and, and Jordan and, and the Emirates to bring both regions together to promote tolerance, dialogue, interfaith dialogue is very important for me. So I think that we can play a very important role of bringing these regions together. And at some point, the war is going to end. Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, at some point it's going to end. So it, it will, there will be better time for this region and we have to use that time and that opportunity to bring those regions together and bring uh, the faith, the religion, the races, everybody together uh, fighting for a better war. Do you think Jordan can be, which as we said is doing an amazing job when it comes to welcoming refugees, can be, take as an, uh, can be taken as an example of how to manage this crisis? The, the, not just the refugee crisis, the leadership of King Abdallah, the Jordanian government and the Jordanian people is amazing. Now, how can they receive the refugees? not just from Syria now, but from Palestine, from Iraq, from different countries, and they can allow them to live uh, a decent life in this country. And also uh, how we see King Abdallah being able to talk to different religious leaders, political leaders. He can talk to, to all the head of states with a lot of respect. So that's very important. That's the reason why we're bring, bringing closer ties with Jordan, because we see his leadership as very important of being able to achieve our objective of bringing our regions together. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We definitely wait you in India. We will be most welcome. Looking forward for that visit, and, and I know that the relationship between Panama and India are going to strength. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.